Okay, so uh, first of all, I would like to welcome you all and thank you for your attendance. Um, today it is sponsored by us, Nova Nordisk, and um, of course, uh, Dr. Uh, Mahmoud uh, Zre is moderating the event. He's an interventional cardiologist and the director of ICC, and I would like to hand the floor um, uh, to you, Dr. Mahmoud. You can uh, lead the meeting. Okay, thank you, Doha. I am not, not just uh, not just a moderator, I am speaker also today, right? Mm -hmm. okay. yes. Mahmoud is not the director of ICC this time, we did not do elections. Yeah, by force maybe. <laughs> by default, by default. <laughs> okay, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. Today we are pleased to welcome Professor Dr. Wolfgang, a very special guest from, from Germany. Professor Wolfgang, Chief of GI, Hepatology and Diabetes Services. He is also the author of 330 original peer-reviewed articles. Dr. Wolfgang, welcome. This is the first time with us. And uh, also I would like to introduce Dr. Iyas Al Musa. He's well known, he's an interventional cardiologist in the private sector, who will be talking uh, to us today about uh, coronary artery disease and diabetes mellitus. Uh, the Deadly Duetto, a very interesting, very interesting uh, title. Uh, we will start with uh, Dr. Riaz. Is that yes. okay? Oh, of course. Okay, uh, I will share the lecture. Are you going to do it from your side? You, you, you can do it from your side. It can be. You... That's fine. A little bit better. I can do it here. I'll do it. You'll have him. That's fine. Let's have you. Okay. Run the show. Excellent. So thank you very much. Is my voice clear, Mahmoud? Yes, yeah, clear, yeah. Yeah, it's fine. Okay, good evening and uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank Novo Nordisk for arranging this nice event and we're glad to have a, um, a colleague uh, visitor from Germany and we hope that we all will pass this tough time soon together. I'm glad we're not talking about COVID today because I think a lot of us are kind of sick of hearing about COVID and hoping this will get over soon. And we want to talk about things that we will see when we go to practice again, which is for patients with CAD and diabetes. The reason I call this the deadly duetto, the dangerous duetto, is they both can act together to make a lot of problems. And you know, a duetto is a way of people singing together one song to uh, singers. But uh, in the case of CAD and diabetes, this can be a problem. Uh, next, Mahmoud. This is uh, one of the uh, examples of uh, deadly duettos, bad boys, I'm sure you saw those. They cooperate in fighting crime. Next. Uh, CAD is the main cause of death worldwide. Even in the presence of corona and all other problems, CAD, CVD is the problem, is the biggest problem. And diabetes is very common in the Arab world and worldwide. When you combine both together, CAD and diabetes, you have a big issue. And this has been very well recognized and well studied. Next. Uh, diabetes is a cluster of risk factor, which means the, the prevalence of your classical risk factors in people who are non-diabetics is amplified in the presence of diabetes, meaning you have somebody who has diabetes. On top of that, you get the clustering of the hypertension, dyslipidemia, and obesity together. And that amplifies the problem and amplifies its consequences. Next. In general, we as interventional cardiologists, I'm sure our uh, colleagues from endocrinology, agree that diabetes is a vasculopathy state. It's a bad vasculopathy state, meaning that our patients, when they come to us and they're diabetics, they're more likely to have diffuse disease. They're not going to have one spot focal lesion that we're going to fix with one metal stent. They're going to more they're more likely to have multivessel disease. Diabetics are more likely to have a small reference vessel, small diffuse disease, making it more difficult for us to do an intervention or even for the surgeon to do a bypass. They're less likely to have collaterals of the uh, occluded vessels. They're more likely to have left main disease. So when you're facing a patient with diabetes and CAD, 
First, you are likely to have a complex disease, has need for more interventions, a complex procedure, whether it be an intervention or open heart. The second point is diabetics frequently has silent ischemia and silent infarctions. That's why sometimes they present late after they already have left ventricular dysfunction or reversible damage to the myocardium. And they're more likely to have acceleration of their atherosclerosis. Sometimes they can go, they pass into the stage where they really come back every few months with a new event. And that's a combination of an endothelial dysfunction, a state of prothrombosis, they're more likely to have clots, and their hyperglycemia. This combination of hyperglycemia, and insulin resistance, endothelial dysfunction, and prothrombotic state adds to an atherosclerosis that is far more aggressive than your average atherosclerosis in general population. Next. In general, diabetics have a bad or worse prognosis. After an MI, when they come to the ER with an MI and they're diabetic, they're more likely to have complications. They are more likely to have complications after PCI. Your failure rate is more when you operate on somebody who is diabetic, when you do a stent, because they're more likely to have calcific disease, more likely to have diffuse disease, more likely to have bifurcational disease. So in general, we treat diabetes as CAD equivalent, especially when it's diagnosed for a while. There is a debate in the literature about the duration of diabetes. It qualifies the patient to be CAD equivalent. But most of us would look at somebody who's 10 years, has a diabetes for 10 years, and say, well, probably already have a significant CAD at this time, even if he or she show no symptoms. Next. Uh, now, a few points about hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia, the high blood sugar itself, is a marker or a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, even in the non-diabetic range, even if you don't reach the 126, the, the golden number, or 150 or 160 above that. If you're in the range of increasing blood sugar, but you're not really frank diabetic, you, you, you start carrying the risk of cardiovascular disease. And hyperglycemia has a big issue, which is they worsen the endothelium function. They have more likely, they're more likely to cause the endothelium not to act functionally, which means when you have high blood sugar, <coughs> this interferes with a, a cascade of things, including lipoproteins and clotting factors to cause more oxidative stress, which may translate into more events. That's why prediabetes is a serious condition. Some patient will come to you and say, well, my blood sugar has been 115, 120 for 10 years. And they think they're fine. I'm not diabetic. But that's not true because they are in the range where they can have progression of their disease without feeling it, and they may come to you too late. Next. Uh, the, the, what we call diabetic dyslipidemia is a collection of factors that is uh, present in diabetics, which is not simply a high LDL or low HDL. In general, diabetics have normal LDL, like the average population, but they have low HDL and high triglycerides. And their LDL is character, characteristic known as a small dense LDL, which is very well characterized in literature as more oxidizable, more likely to go into the wall of the vessels and call atherosclerosis. So not all, not all LDLs are created the same. Diabetics are more likely to have the small dense LDL, which is more oxidizable, more likely to be atherogenic than the other sizes of uh, LDL. Next. Now, the field of function is important in diabetics. I would like to point that patients with diabetes have a host of abnormalities, including abnormal adhesion of the leukocytes and endothelial function. A host of cytokines go into that. Very important thing is the impairment of what we call endothelium-dependent relaxation of the vasculature, meaning when you exercise, your vessels have to dilate. And if you don't do that, even if you don't have significant obstructive CAD, you can have angina and ischemia. So in diabetics, they can't mount an endothelium-dependent vasodilatation because of their condition. And that means the patient will come to you with angina. You may cast them and they find mild disease. It's not the end of the story. They have angina because they cannot dilate their vessels in response to an exercise or a stress. That's why some patients will come to us 
having more angina when they have high blood sugar. And when they control the diabetes, their angina gets less because that endoscular function can be improved by aggressive medical therapy. Next. Now, one sentence to, to remind our colleagues that diabetes is a prothrombotic state. Diabetes is not high blood sugar. Diabetics are more likely to clot their vessels. They have more a problem with their, anti, with their coagulation and with the intrinsic fibrinolytic system. These are impaired mechanisms. Their platelets are more active, more angry, more likely to cause clots. That's why patients with diabetes, they can have more MIs, more strokes. Even if you control their uh, cholesterol or their blood sugar, that's the end of the story. That's not the end of the story. They have multiple other mechanisms that are impaired that cause them to be prothrombotic. Next. Okay, now when you revascularize diabetic patients, in general, this is less effective because of a few things. The ICC is the Interventional Cardiovascular Club, and whenever we show a case of intervention, we see that patients with diabetes come, sometimes they're late, they have diffuse disease, they're more likely to be incompletely revascularized because you have all these branches that you say, well, that's too small, that's too complex, let's just fix the big vessel. And in general, we need to have more aggressive revascularization and medical therapy for either medically or interventionally treated patients because their prognosis depends on the aggressiveness of your medical therapy and the completeness of revascularization, which is always a challenge in diabetic patients. Next. Now, these factors will tell you, well, let's stop there. Sometimes no more research is needed. If you have a clear fact like the one in this uh, slide, the, the, the chicken is getting uh, punished for a clear problem here, and you don't need to do more research in this case. But in Jordan, we had few cases to show, and we studies, these few studies that we have done, and I would like to show one of them. Next, Mahmoud. Uh, the glucometabolic abnormalities in acute coronary syndrome study in Jordan. This is called the GLORY study, also uh, proudly done by the JCC group, uh, headed by Dr. Ayman Hamoudeh. 600 plus ACS patients were evaluated on admission. The treatment was looked at, the labs were assessed, and their one-year survival and a complication was uh, followed, specifically looking at the prevalence of their, how often they have diabetes or previously diagnosed or how often they are diagnosed just on admission. Next, Mahmoud. And if you look at this, this is the breakdown of the patient. The five, half of them have unstable angina and about 16% have non-STEMI and 30% uh, have ST elevation MI. Next. This is the breakdown at admission. Next, Mahmoud. Now, if you look at the... Uh, their status, the glucometabolic status on admission, a third were non-diabetic, a 44% were diabetic. So you can say that in Jordan, 44% of patients are having diabetes on admission with ACS, but we have 11% who have new diabetes. They were not diagnosed before. They were just discovered to be diabetics on admission, and you have 13% impaired fasting glucose. So this is a breakdown on admission. Only 30% have no problem with their blood sugar. Seven out of 10 of ACS patients in Jordan have abnormal glucometabolic state, whether it's frank diabetes diagnosed before or in about 25% of patients, either frank new diabetes diagnosed just today on admission or impaired fasting glucose. Next. Now, next. Okay, now the... In all patients in this study, the mortality was as follows. If you look here on admission, before discharge hospital admission, 2.5% uh, was, 2.6% uh, was the mortality of all ACS patients. One month mortality was 4%, and the one year was 7.2 in all the patients, all comers being diabetic or non-diabetic. Next. Now, in hospital mortality, if you break it down according to the glucometabolic states, if you're non-diabetic, your mortality is 1.9, 2.1 if you're diabetic, but look at this. This jumps to 5.7% if you are newly diagnosed diabetic. You're diagnosed just on admission, and it's 3.4% if you're impaired fasting glucose. So these patients did worse. The previously diagnosed diabetics did better than those who were just diagnosed on admission 
with diabetes or impaired fasting glucose in terms of mortality. Next. If you look at the one month mortality, break it down again. No diabetes here, diabetes more, but significant difference in the new diabetics and then the impaired fasting glucose. So new diabetics have much worse one month mortality compared to the overall mortality of the study. Next. Now, if you look at one year mortality, again, the trend is obvious. No diabetes, 4.8%, diabetics 7.5%, newly diagnosed 17.1%, and impaired fasting 3.4%. So the, the, the one that stands out very clearly is the worst prognosis of someone who gets diagnosed with diabetes on admission for an ACS without prior knowledge. Next. And if you look at the one year cardiovascular event, lumping, of course, mortality or need for revascularization and new MI or a stroke, you can still see that our patients still have 18% of, even if they're non-diabetic, of coming back for an event. This is worse in diabetics, of course. This is much worse in newly diagnosed diabetics and less in impaired fasting glucose. So the trend is there, but the mortality difference was the more obvious in this study. Next. So mortality cases will continue. Some cases will always be there. You can't save everybody. This man here will probably have an intracranial hemorrhage in one second because this vehicle is moving away and he will hit his head. So you cannot prevent, you cannot save all. Next, but you can try. <clears throat> it makes sense if you discover that you're diabetic only when you are coming with an acute coronary syndrome, then the prognosis is much worse because you pay the price of years of ongoing vasculopathy, undiagnosed, untreated dyslipidemia, abnormal coagulation. That's why we need to screen and aggressively treat patients, pre-diabetics, to prevent the progression to the vasculopathy of diabetes. Next. Don't miss, or don't be, let's, don't be fooled. Don't be fooled by high blood sugar on admission. Because sometimes people say, well, the patient has stress hyperglycemia. Oh, the blood sugar is high because they're coming with an MI. They're just anxious. Let's just wait till it goes down. Stress hyperglycemia can be fatal if you misdiagnose it. If you don't diagnose it, we say, oh, let's wait till blood sugar will go down. This is a marker that this patient is having a worse prognosis. Mild impaired fasting glucose may come next time. Adjash, Shreem Mahmoud, go back. Mild impaired fasting glucose next time may come to you with a frank diabetes and acute coronary syndrome. So when someone has a mild impaired fasting glucose, their blood sugar is 105, treat them with risk factors, with the metformin, with whatever. I'm sure we, our colleagues will talk about that because glory showed that this group is having a bad prognosis. Do not underestimate this phenomenon. Next. I'll finish. Uh, once upon a time, we were not part of diabetes care. Cardiologists, we didn't talk about diabetes. We did not have these joint conferences with endocrinologists. We sent our diabetic patients to endocrinology. We didn't want to know their blood sugar because we were under the impression that we cannot help them. We cannot uh, reduce their CVD by reducing the blood glucose from the previous trials. Next. But nowadays, some new diabetic medications were discovered, and these are cardiac and life-saving, these are cardio-beneficial life-saving medications that happen to reduce the blood glucose too. That's why we as cardiologists believe that we are part co-owners of this disease now. And that's why we are interested in this topic. Next. Okay, so my final conclusion, HbA1c for me now means H for heart, B is benefits, A is always number one is number one, and consideration. Heart benefits always number one consideration. If you reduce the blood sugar, HbA1c, you're doing that because you want to help your patient not get an MI or a stroke. Next. So aggressive risk factor modification in diabetic patients cannot be overemphasized. New agents like GLP-1 and SGLT-2 are game changers and are probably now first line therapy. Next, and thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yes, for uh, very, this is very interesting uh, presentation. We will let the, the questions at the end. Okay. Agree with me? Yes, yes, I agree. Okay, with we start. Uh, the stage is yours, Dr. Wolfgang. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just one second. I let you to share your uh, presentation. The presentation with you. You have it? 
you can uh, just get into it. Oh, I have to go to the email because just. No, I mean, yeah, otherwise I. You have I it. I don't know. What we... Shall I um, open it? Yeah, yeah. You go for uh, below share screen, click. And uh, then. Um, I think you, the host has to activate this. Is that true? No, no, I, I give you, okay, Would, uh, just one second. Stop sharing my slides. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How do we get to my presentation? All presentation. Yeah. I think I send it over to you. So, so it should be in somewhere. Okay, you, you can go now and they click to the presentation. I don't see the presentation at the moment. Uh, I don't, don't see it. I only see if uh, Mahmoud uh, Israik has a picture. Okay. Ah, Mahmoud has a picture. Mahmoud, did you stop sharing okay. my presentation? Okay, one second, one second. I already stopped the... Okay. Oh, Dr. Yeah. Wolfgang is a panelist. He can share his. Yeah, Dr. He should, have, he should now, share screen. Yeah. You go for sh uh, share screen and click there, and you can find out the, your uh, presentation in your laptop. You just open it in, in the desktop. In the desktop? Yeah. Uh, let me see. First of all, open your presentation and put it in the desktop and then go to the share screen and click there and then you can share with that. Uh Do you see that? I opened my presentation just no. on okay. my computer. Now go go to the share screen. Um, click, click there. Where do I do that? It's below. There is item which is called share screen. Click there. You should see a panel that says Q and A chat yeah. share screen. Um, okay. Then I have to go back to the Zoom. Yeah, go back to the Zoom. You already opened, uh, you already, uh, your uh, presentations. Yeah, and. Um, in your, in your uh, desktop. Yeah, yeah, I see it, okay. Okay, now you go to the share screen. Yeah. And open it through it. Yeah. Now it should be in. Yeah. Uh, excellent. Good. Yep. Yeah. Go and we go like this. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. You Perfect. 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 Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Okay. So yeah. Hello to everybody. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Of course, it would be much nicer to visit you in your beautiful city of Amman. Last year I was there and gave also a lecture. And so we can all pray that uh, maybe next year if there is a phase of after corona crisis yeah we hope so we could do that again yeah you all agree 100 percent. that's good okay so i like uh, i enjoyed very much your lecture uh, dr al musa and uh, i totally agree with all the facts in there uh, it's really crucial that we treat pre-diabetic states and uh, probably, as you said, your explanation for that uh, newly diagnosed diabetes persons uh, have a much worse prognosis is that they really went on with that state already for some years. We find people with ACS in our cardiology department with an HbA1c of 10% showing up and didn't know that they had diabetes. 
So they had all the problems of this lipidemia and high blood glucose and oxidation of uh, small LDLs and so on. So it's uh, really a good study and it uh, illustrates the problem. Okay, so I was asked to discuss a little bit with you because uh, I think you are a group of mainly cardiologists and also some internists and uh, also some GPs. I think that is uh, correct, but no endos. I must admit also I am a full-blown gastroenterologist as well as diabetologist. That is the reason why we are in the past and still are very much interested in these GLP-1 analogs because GLP-1, as you know, is a hormone of the gut and that creates the bridge between the gut and the endocrine pancreas. So it's uh, somehow also nice to um, speak a little bit uh, about gut and gut brain axis and the pancreas. So guidelines and controversies in the treatment of type 2 diabetes patients in CV patients, uh, I think we should discuss them in the light of typical patients. We will uh, have that uh, in a minute. And of course, uh, the sponsor uh, wants also to know how we uh, judge about Lyra glutide in clinical practice. Disclosures, um, our laboratory and my department gets uh, support from a number of companies. So I would say we are quite a little bit independent of each of them. And uh, more important is the support we get from nonprofit organizations like the German Research Foundation, German Diabetes Association, my own university, that's the Ruhr University of Bochum, and also EASD and ADA. That is exactly what Dr. Al Musa was telling you, um, that life expectancy is reduced by a quite a, a heavy um, amount of years in patients with diabetes and CVD. You see here uh, in a person at uh, the, uh, his age or her age of 60, no diabetes. So probably now in Germany, they or she or he had a life expectancy, I would say, of 85, maybe 86, even if he already reached 60. With the diabetes, that goes with minus six years from the statistics. That's the JAMA paper of the Emergent Risk Factors Collaboration, huge study, although registry. But if diabetes is combined with what your main subject is, MI or stroke, so cardiovascular disease, then the loss of lives is double, minus 12 years. So that's quite significant. Um, always cardiologists, when we discuss between uh, or in, among uh, endocrinologists, diabetologists, cardiologists, uh, in the past, some cardiologists said, oh, you diabetologists or endocrinologists, you don't have endpoint studies, there are no heart studies, you uh, discuss about HbA1c, but at the end of the day, Mortality is the point you have to follow. That's true. All the other, the old interventional studies we don't want to discuss today did not show any benefit of a very drastic decrease in HbA1c. But a tiny little study, the Steno2, you are all aware of that, that showed already a um, significant effect. And you know there, conventional treatment of type 2 diabetes uh, meant, uh, let's say, a little bit of antihypertensive treatment, a little bit of cholesterol, and also a um, little bit of diabetes, and intensive address all these entities in a small group of patients, two times 80, but also all of these intensives got ASS aspirin. And uh, the advantage of that study, really long follow-up, and what you see here is the cumulative mortality, and clearly you can identify that it is uh, of great benefit for the patient to have an intensive treatment on all sides, on dyslipidemia, hypertension, with aspirin to attack the platelet dysfunction, and also on diabetes. So, of course, one could not distinguish between the different uh, interventional uh, components, but it was a very nice result. And for us as diabetologists, that was the first study showing a mortality benefit of intensive treatment, at least including HbA1c intervention. So then, of course, the whole world turned when the first CVOTs, cardiovascular outcome studies, 
for anti-diabetic medications came up. And you all know these studies, they marked really a turn point in type 2 diabetes treatment. And the first study, or one of the first studies, was the LIDA study for liraglutide, showing a significant benefit for um, liraglutide, a GLP-1 receptor agonist, with this triple endpoint of uh, non-fatal stroke, non-fatal myocardial infarction, and um, <clears throat> making this as a triple endpoint uh, for um, the outcome uh, of a newly developed drug. You all know that was an, uh, um, a law by the FDA that any new anti-diabetic medication should show this safety in long-term cardiovascular outcome studies. And the LIDA study and also the MPAREC study showed, uh, as the first two studies, a uh, significant benefit, not only non-inferiority, but superiority. And that was true also for the newly developed uh, once a time, uh, once a week, um, semaglutide molecule, very similar to liraglutide, but uh, from the uh, galenic preparation modified uh, that it's really working once a week. And for other studies, and I just included here for you, albiglutide, um, also a GLP-1 receptor agonist, also had a superior outcome and more or less the same was true for dulaglutide. And on the other hand, we have the second the large group of novel anti-diabetic medicines, the SGLT2 inhibitors, and they showed the same all over the class, more or less, with little differences. Dapatliflozin had a little problem in this uh, single endpoint. They did some, let's say, combinational endpoint. But in principle, more or less the same outcome. And then for the SGLT2 inhibitors, and that's very important, I think, for you as cardiologists, they had a very strong effect on heart failure. See here the picture, uh, hospitalization for heart failure, for empatliflozin, for carnatliflozin, and also for DAPA. And that's really a difference. Um, so from that point on, um, the, these uh, substances were developed also as a direct treatment for heart failure, uh, regardless whether a person has diabetes or not. These studies uh, have been finished uh, in part. You all know the DAPA uh, heart failure study. Also similar studies will come up from EMPA and we have some studies on CANVAS. So that is also a real revolution in type 2 diabetes treatment with a special focus on heart failure. But uh, because of your, you are di um, cardiologists now more and more interested in also your diabetes patients, let's speak a, f a few minutes uh, on pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes. I think that is important to understand why these novel compounds, especially the GLP-1 receptor agonists, are of big advantage. So pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes means we have impaired insulin secretion, we have an increased exaggerated glucagon secretion that is part of the dysfunction of the islet cell secretion. We have a decreased incretin effect and we have a strong problem in the liver. I'm sure that most of your patients with diabetes and even with newly diagnosed the diabetes have what we call NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. If they drink also a little bit alcohol on top of that, then they have a combination of non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is identical to the metabolic syndrome of the liver, and then alcohol uh, would really enhance uh, the problem on the liver. And that re uh, leads to severe hepatic insulin resistance and is an indicator, at least an indicator for cardiovascular problems and disease. Impaired appetite regulation, we will address that in a minute, increased lipolysis, also muscular insulin resistance, and a little bit increased glucose reabsorption that does not very much contribute to the diabetes. But Ralf de Fronzo in his famous lecture here on the ominous octet mentioned also that factor. So why are GLP-1 receptor agonists really of advantage from a pathophysiological point of view? 
Uh, and that is because GLP-1 receptor agonists have not only an effect on the pancreas, that is well studies, increasing insulin secretion, bringing down the glucagon secretion, but also on the heart. Not directly mainly, but more indirectly. And probably the best studied factors are a contra-inflammatory effect, that is after what Dr. Al Musa was saying, of very much uh, uh, advantage. So this inflammation of the arterial wall is improved by GLP-1 receptor agonists. That's shown in lots of animal studies and also small proof of concept studies. And we have this beneficial effect on systolic blood pressure, a direct effect to five to six, sometimes seven millimeter of mercury. So that is something you as cardiologists would agree that this is already clinically significant. Then we have a direct effect on the brain, uh, interfering with our appetite regulation. And I will show you some of the fascinating results here. It is a direct central effect. And of course, most of your patients, I guess, um, coming into your catheterization laboratory are overweight, they are insulin resistant with newly diagnosed diabetes, for instance, and they need, of course, weight loss. And that is something GLP-1 receptor agonists can provide. Then we have uh, effect on stomach. That's uh, inhibition of gastric emptying, in part in favor that would ameliorate your postprandial glucose, of course, if the meal stays in the stomach. But it's also the basis of some of the side effects, nausea a little bit, um, uh, feeling fullness and so on. But uh, that can be overcome if you direct your patient in a proper way. And then on the liver, lots of effects on the liver, but all indirect. The liver has no GLP-1 receptor receptors expressing. But we do see, because of the contra-inflammatory effect and also on the weight loss side, we see a decrease in steatosis. Um, now the semaglutide is uh, going to be evaluated as a direct drug in NASH. So in the combination NASH plus cardiovascular disease, that would be also a topic for you, I guess. So you can even... Uh, well, um, uh, do some treatment here without asking the hepatologist. I'm also a hepatologist, so I do now make advertisements against, against my own uh, group of uh, colleagues. But it is uh, a side effect, a wanted side effect of the treatment. This is the very famous slide from Michael Nauk and our group, a first or not first, but very much in detail describing what happens if you give GLP-1 in a study group of deranged type 2 diabetes patients. You see here a very high fasting plasma glucose of 15. If you infuse now at that time, long ago, native GLP-1 to these patients, you can normalize these enormous increased fast fasting plasma glucose. What is the reason behind that? immediate stimulation of insulin secretion. Uh, and that is a long running type two diabetes group. So even there you can stimulate the first phase of insulin secretion, recreate that by GLP-1. And uh, that is the third uh, important point. If the increased blood glucose levels turn to normal, almost normal, then this stimulation of insulin secretion goes down. So that means GLP-1 normalizes FPG without inducing hypoglycemia. So it has an inbuilt protection against hypoglycemia. So you as a cardiologist don't have to worry about always measuring blood glucose. It cannot really happen. It only happens if you combine GLP-1 receptor analogs with other hypoglycemic drugs, long-acting SUs or, of course, insulin. And the third point is that the elevated glucagon levels are reduced by GLP-1 and that is also a highly wanted phenomenon for uh, treatment of type 2 diabetes. So um, effect of GLP-1 is glucose dependent, no risk for hypoglycemia. How does that work? Only two minutes for you as cardiologists. That's an islet of Langerhans. And it summarizes a number of studies in humans and animals and so on. So if GLP-1 
um, really flushes these Langerhans islets, what uh, is the effect? First, it sensitizes the inactive beta cells to active beta cells. So that means they turn now blue. They are now active beta cells ready to secrete insulin. That has been shown in CLEMP studies, in single cell studies, also in human beta cells, a very established phenomenon. Now these active beta cells secrete insulin as they should do. But GLP-1 also stimulates the delta cell. The delta cell secretes somatostatin and somatostatin locally in the islet then brings down the glucagon. So that is the mechanism, as we believe, as a diabetologist, what happens in the islet of pancreas, in the uh, islet of Langerhans. The second important effect of GP1 is on the stomach. I told you it's a very potent inhibitor of gastric emptying with these two sides of the coin. But GLP-1 can directly affect the brain. You will ask, okay, GLP-1 is a peptide. How can that enter the brain? I will show you in a minute. It induces satiety signals via the gastrointestinal tract with the nerve, the vagal nerve, traveling to the uh, brainstem and then inducing satiety, but also directly crossing the blood-brain barrier. The result is induction of satiety, energy intake goes down, and weight loss in our patients. Is there really proof that it is entering the brain? Yes, there is. That can only be shown in animal experiments, but very beautiful and important animal experiments. Here from the Copenhagen group in, mouse, um, in mice, they were injected by an um, <clears throat> liraglutide fluorescently labeled injected in the periphery. So from the periphery, it could go into the brain and they checked it here by an, a very sophisticated tomography, a histological tomography method. What can you see? That's the supraoptic nucleus. That's uh, also supraoptic decusation and more important, paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus. That's the center of our appetite and uh, satiety regulation. And what you see here is real liraglutide labeled and had crossed the blood-brain barrier is now in the brain. And the most and strongest signal at the median eminence and the nucleus aquatus. And that is also involved in a satiety and appetite regulation. So this is a very interesting finding saying that GLP-1 receptor agonist, but it has only shown in this study for liraglutide, is uh, directly bringing down the appetite signal in the brain and influences that also via the GI tract. So let's turn again to what is more maybe fascinating for you, but uh, also that is fascinating to understand the working hypothesis of the molecule, the cardiovascular outcome studies. And you saw them already, the three-point maze has been defined by the FDA and by the whole uh, diabetes community and also important, of course, for all of you with this non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke and CV death. And what you see here are three examples of GLP-1 receptor agonists. Again, the leader, liraglutide, the sustained six, semaglutide, and rewind, in that case, dulaglutide. Let's have a look to the most recent meta-analysis of all the GLP-1 receptor agonist CDOT studies, systematic review. So um, with regard to the prime and primary endpoint, that was the tree component maze. And you see here all the studies, LIDA, SUSTAIN, Excel, and so on, showed an effect on the side favoring GLP-1 receptor agonist treatment. The Excel study was not significant, but almost significant, just missing here the confidence interval. Elixa, that is uh, um, uh, the only study that did not show any effect. That is the, the uh, molecule by Sanofi, but uh, that um, uh, molecule had really a very short half-life. Sanofi wanted to market it still as a once daily injection, and that was certainly the completely wrong decision. So no one would give that anymore 
with regard to influencing cardiovascular outcome. But the others are quite homogeneous. That's the overall mod meta-analysis, quite convincing, large number of studies, as you would like to see them, uh, because your cardiology studies are in the same range. This is cardiovascular death. And um, what is interesting here also, the overall analysis is absolutely significant for all the studies. EXA, ELIXA study, um, you would also uh, think, okay, that is expected, uh, was ineffective, but the others were well done. Uh, the SUSTAIN study was a very small pre-approval study, not powered uh, for any of the subtypes here. Um, so it did not show the same effect. The others showed uh, here a quite significant effect. And then probably for most of you, all-cause mortality, that's really the fact uh, in, in many of the cardiology studies. And um, here we see a little bit more heterogeneous picture, but still when you combine everything, all the ones and also including, to be fair, this ELIXA study, which should be skipped because from the beginning on, no one believed that that could show any effect. But nevertheless, you have to include everything. And when you see here, it's also significant um, on a significant level uh, with a 12% uh, risk reduction for all cause mortality. So I think that's in the light that this is an anti diabetic treatment that is really a major step forward. <clears throat> Not to forget about renal benefit. Um, this is a composite kidney outcome, including macroalbuminuria for all the studies here. And you see here also, not all studies had that endpoint. So some had to be excluded because no information was in the study uh, trial. And you see here, the meta-analysis also shows more or less the same degree of benefit, 17% risk reduction. Uh, it's maybe not not at the same level as compared to the SGLT2 inhibitors. They are a little bit higher from the numbers, but there's no head-to-head CDOT comparing SGLT2 inhibitor and GLP-1 receptor agonist. So one cannot be absolutely sure. But at least also on, in that field, GLP-1 receptor agonist shows something. So finally now let's turn to the guidelines. And I um, prepared for you two guidelines, which might uh, be of interest for all of us to discuss it. And one is um, the very, I would say, provocative uh, guideline of the European Society for Cardiology uh, 2019, uh, with the title 2019 ESC Guidelines on Diabetes, Prediabetes, and CV Diseases Developed Together with the EASD. First author, Consentino. And what uh, did they recommend? So they had a number of slides and a lot of things in their recommendations, and I only uh, pick up for you two, th two slides. And that is recommended treatment in drug naive patients. That means drug naive, type 2 diabetes, newly diagnosed. Let's consider Dr. Al Musa's uh, nice presentation. Those you see in the catheterization laboratory, and now they show up first time with the diabetes. No anti diabetic medication. So, what do they say? If they have ASCVD or high or very high CV risk factors, target organ damage, that will be, of course, then. Uh, AS, um, the ACS after you have then shown all the stenosis and the small vessels or multiple risk factors, go directly to SGLT2 inhibitor or GLP-1 receptor monotherapy. If not, if this is not present, then start metformin monotherapy. Well, the endocrinologist among my uh, friends and colleagues uh, were very controversial about that point, and we can discuss it in a minute. Whether really there is data in these CVOTs that support that statement, I would put a big question mark. Okay, and then they follow what the ASD, EASD is telling you. If it's above target, then they switch to HbA1c and saying, okay, if that is about target, individual target, then do something else, add other drugs. Okay, so 
SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonists are recommended by ESC in drug-naive patients with ASCVD or high risk factors as first-line therapy. Is that what we all support? Second group of patients on metformin, Dr. Al Musa, that would be your patients maybe with diagnosed type 2 diabetes. Maybe they are already on a more complex treatment, okay. But if SCVD is present or all these risk factors, go for SGLT2 and GLP1 receptor agonists. Yes, I think there would be also among the diabetologists not very much arguments against that. We would even see, say, if that is a patient on metformin and SU, please stop SU and exchange it for GLP-1 receptor ionist or SGLT2 inhibitor. And of course, if that is not the case, then it goes more to the endo and continue metformin and do a rational uh, choice combination according to several preferences. Maybe that is not in the absolute focus uh, of your patients. So conclusion, SGLT2 and GP1 receptor agonists are recommended in patients with these ASCVDs and so on, irrespective of HbA1c. Yes, here as an endo or diabetologist, I would follow one exception, irrespective of HbA1c. If that patient has an HbA1c of 13, you should consider insulin. That is important. Otherwise, you would not really stop that hypo, hyperglycemia and the glucotoxicity of that very severe situation. So it's a little bit um, single-minded, I would say, but we can discuss that. Then uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist of that uh, ESC 2019 um, statement says recommendation, liraglutide, semaglutide, dulaglutide are recommended. Class one recommendation level A of evidence because very many studies have supported that and all have CVOTs. Liraglutide is recommended uh, in addition to reduce the risk of death. You saw this effect on cardiovascular death and all cause mortality. It's level B of evidence because it was a secondary endpoint, not a primary endpoint, but it's very nice to have. And that's again uh, the studies you are now knowing. That is all cause mortality again, and the significant effect in the LIDA Lira glutide study, um, clear cut confidence interval is significant, but it was a secondary endpoint. Now, the second type of recommendations, ADA EASD consensus report 2018 to 2020, that did some additions, glucose lowering medication in type 2 diabetes. So the endos, uh, your endo friends would say, first line therapy is still metformin and comprehensive lifestyle. If there is a high risk situation or established ASCVD or CKD or heart failure, then we go this way, but metformin remains first recommended uh, line of glucose lowering medication. If there's no presence of all these points, then we can go here to the right and could follow that up. Let's first consider the patients you are interested in. Uh, so indicators or established uh, CV disease. And here, if ASCVD predominates, so no heart failure, maybe a little bit diastolic or severe diastolic dysfunction, that is of course uh, a part of heart failure, not very well studied at the moment with regard to GLP-1 receptor agonists. Also problems with the SGLT2 inhibitors. I think there will now start. There are studies now ongoing with uh, heart failure preserved ejection fraction and non-preserved ejection fraction, and that will answer then those studies. There have been some disappointments already, but we will see whether at the end of the day, and we can discuss that very openly, whether we will have also a treatment, a highly needed treatment for treatment of diastolic dysfunction, so, so to say heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So preferred here in the ASCVD group is GLP-1 receptor agonist with proven benefit, of course. So not from the ELIXA study, um, that compound or SGLT2 inhibitor with a proven benefit. 
Um, if eight uh, heart failure or CKD predominates, and you see here the criteria, then SGLT2 inhibitor goes first, also with proven benefit. If there is some contraindication or whatever, then also GLP-1 receptor agonist can be used, as said here. Okay, and if that is not the case, then we have all the choices to minimize hypoglycemia. That is probably something you would then refer to the endo. If weight gain is a problem, certainly GLP-1 receptor agonists are first choice because they are more potent to induce weight loss compared to SGLT2 inhibitors, no doubt about that. Also head-to-head -head studies are available. And if cost is a little bit here missing, if cost is really a factor, of course, then you have to switch to more uh, inexpensive options, and that is SU or TCDs. TCDs, please not in heart failure. They put on water and weight. Um, some other options are available there. Intensifying to injectable therapies, I think that is then also not primarily your subject, more subject of the endos then. Of course, there is the situation where insulin comes into uh, the play and into the therapy. And of course, then all education has to be done. And I think you have to then, uh, as cardiologists, at least to cooperate um, with some kind of diabetologist or endocrinologist. So that's last slide, dear colleagues. We are a little bit or late already. What I would like to discuss with you, but uh, please feel free also at the end um, to put up any question, is first the ESC guidelines of 2019. To uh, repeat that, SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists are recommended in drug-naive newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes patients with ASCVD or very high risk factors as first line therapy. You agree? Question two, ADA ESD consensus report, patients with ASCVD, GLP-1 receptor agonist, in example, liraglutide, first line, patients with heart failure, CKD, SGLT2 inhibitors. MPAD liflozin, DAPAD liflozin, they have the best uh, study evidences. First line, you agree? Question three, ADA ESD consensus report, maybe more at sight for the cardiologist intensification of therapy. And here the consensus report of ADA ESD says GLP-1 receptor agonists always prior to insulin to be considered. This is something even endos uh, are a little bit, oh, well, should we do that? I think we, I am convinced we should do it. Uh, I think there are many type 2 diabetes patients who have too much insulin. Novo Nordis, as you know, is also an insulin company, so they have to close their ears now. But they have very nice GLP-1 receptor agonist molecules, so it should be at least considered before you put a person on insulin, and I think this is also in favor for you as cardiologists, you don't want, I guess, to treat patients with insulin with all the problems. There you need a little bit the endos, but GLP-1 receptor agonist is an option before. You agree or not? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wolfgang. This is very interesting lectures. Uh, now we'll go for uh, for my presentation, right? And then, yeah. uh, then uh, we'll open for, for the questions. Yeah. Okay, my, uh, my presentations, just I have <laughs> one case to discuss with you. Coronary artery disease and diabetic kidney disease. This is the case I would present today is a 55 year old male patient, diabetic type two, hypertensive, body mass index 33, known to have coronary artery disease recently. 10 days ago, CAT was done for him, and I will show you the result. ECHO showed mild LV impairment, hemoglobin 1 ac 7.5, fasting blood sugar 140 milligram per deciliter, and creatine clearance 25 mil per minute. He was treated with aspirin, metoprolol 100 milligram twice daily, atorvastatin 40 milligram once daily, mm -hmm and he was on metformin 500 milligram twice daily. This is uh, just to show you 
this is a cath, this is a left main. There is a severe distal left main lesion. And in addition to that, there is a circumflex severe lesion, 99%. So, and this is LAD, subtotal LAD occlusion. So we are dealing with uh, three vessel disease, established coronary artery disease. So what we have, what we have here, we have a 55 year old diabetic, coronary artery disease, uh, stage four renal failure, creatine class 25, hemoglobin 1C 7.5, body mass index, this is wrong, 33. So what we should do? The question is how we do manage? Keep in mind the patient rejected insulin therapy. A, continue on the same medication therapy. B, discontinue metformin, add saxagliptin. C, discontinue metformin, add linagliptin. D, discontinue metformin, add impagliflozin. E, discontinue metformin, add GLP-1 liraglutide. So let's discuss one by one. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we, the panelists will discuss with me the case. So one thing is important. Yeah. Metformin, it is excellent and good drug, but there is a limitation. Two things. One of, the, one of those things is creatine clearance less than 45. It's contraindicated. Unless, yeah. unless you are yeah. already on metformin, if the creatine clearance less than 45, between 45 and 30, and then you can just, uh, decrease the dose up to 50%. But our case, we have uh, creatine clearance 25. Absolutely, you don't use metformin. It's contraindicated because of the risk of lactic acidosis. Do you agree yeah. with me? Yes, um, it's true. Um, we have a little bit different uh, approval for the metformin. And that says if um, the, G, the uh, EGFR goes below 60, you reduce from full dose, that is in Europe, either two times 1,000, or in Italy or in Spain, sometimes they do three times 1,000, you go to two times 500. That was uh, already, of course, done here in that uh, person. Probably his uh, renal function maybe was a little better in the past. Yes. But you are absolutely right. The absolute contraindication level is 30. So if you are below 30, then stop metformin. Okay. So option A, it's out. Let's go to the yeah. option B. Discontinue metformin, add saxagliptin. Yeah, so, no one was in favor of that. Yeah. And I think that's a good idea. Uh, uh, you know that even though creatine clearance is six aglaptin can be given in the presence of renal failure stage four, but it is contraindicated yeah. if it is less than 15 ml per minute. And this is one. Exactly. Number two, it is important. This is DPP-4 inhibitors. It is contraindicated in the presence of heart failure. And you mentioned this study, 3P mass, all DPP-4 neutral regarding to the, to the, uh, cardiac mortality, rehospitalizations, and heart failure, except saxagliptin. Saxagliptin, it's contraindicated in the presence of the heart failure. So we don't use it. We don't use saxagliptin in the presence of the heart failure. This is number one. Number two, there is no beneficial, no cardioprotective effect. This is number two. And this, our patient is having mild LV impairment. And in addition to that, again, there is no cardioprotective effect. So option two, it's out. Agree, Dr. Yes? Agree, yes. Yes, absolutely okay. agree. Okay. I mean, um, sex at Lipton had this uh, not very well explained effect, lots of discussion uh, on why um, the number of hospitalizations for heart failure were increased. It's the only substance in the group of um, DPP-4 inhibitors that showed that significantly. Mm -hmm. So um, for us in Germany, I think we don't see any um, uh, argument in favor of sexadliptin because uh, cedadliptin did not have that special problem. So I don't see any indication anymore for sexadliptin. Okay. Now, uh, option C, option C, discontinue metformin, add li linagliptin. 
Mm-hmm. But one word about renal neglect, the best drug for all stages of renal failure is renagliptin. You don't have to adjust the dose. But the problem, also this is DPP-4 inhibitors. We cannot use it in, in cardiovascular. There is no cardiovascular benefit. Safe in severe renal failure, but again, no cardiovascular benefit. For that reason, will the option uh, C will be out. Agree? Yeah. Yes, Any, agree. I anything think, uh, about the, inagliptin? Yeah, the colleagues uh, had, of course, uh, a special, uh, I think, uh, exactly what you said in mind. Linagliptin is metabolized in the liver, so you don't have to uh, think about renal impairment. That's a big advantage. Uh, but as you said, uh, the cardiovascular outcome study, uh, the Carolina study, was, not, was non-inferior, so it was safe but it did not show any benefit. Any benefit, so yeah. this particular patient with ASCVD, it would not be the best option. Option C, discontinue metformin, add impagliflozin. I personally, I like SGL2 inhibitors. It is very good a drug, but you should know, until now, it is not recommended to, get, to take it uh, or prescribe it in the presence of creatinine clearance less than 45 ml. Even though there is the recently studies have been done, DAPA, uh, DAPA cliflozin between 30 and 60 ml, but until now the guidelines, what I know about European guidelines, it's not recommended <coughs> to give empagliflozin in the presence of uh, renal impairment less than 45 per ml. But it is excellent to drug. It is, um, uh, as you show uh, Dr. Wolfgang, in your slides, it is there is a beneficial uh, three mass. Uh, this is including cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, and in addition to that, non-fatal stroke. It is positive drug, but uh, there is a limitation in the presence of severe severe renal failure. So, in my opinion, uh, this option is out. What do you think, Dr. Yes? Yeah, I think these medications work predominantly through the kidneys. And they're tested in patients who do not have renal dysfunction in terms of cardiovascular outcome trials. Until we have a trial showing that they work in mechanisms other than the kidney mechanism, I think they should not be used at the GFR of this magnitude. Dr. Wolfgang? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, in principle, you are right. At the moment, and di- it differs, of course, from country to country, uh, the approval status. All the companies are running for approval in low EGFRs. And I think um, you are right, the effect on glucose metabolism, that means to get glucose via the kidney out of the body, that will decrease. But these uh, substances are heavily renal protective. So one, uh, and that is uh, shown also by the statement of the FDA and the uh, European agency saying, If a patient uh, uh, is higher than or is below 45, as you said, you should not start that. But if a patient is on MPA and it goes down to 35, you don't have to stop it. It's Mm -hmm. a little bit crazy, but it is like that. And so there is now a Kana renal study, there is an MPA renal study and everything, but they have not reached... um, as uh, as far as I know, in certain countries, the level of approval. But it is not probably dangerous. So one has not to worry, oh, is it now 42 or 38? And do I have immediately to stop? No, you don't have to. Uh, It is renal protective, but you should not start it below 45 because then you are in the off-label range and it could create problems. So, E, discontinuum metformin, add GLP-1, liraglutide. GLP-1, what is the evidence-based medicine? It is contraindicated when you have creatine clearance less than 15 ml per minute. Now, there is a published, interesting uh, article published in New England Journal of Medicine, looking at the composite renal outcome, which include the following parameters. A new onset persistent microalbuminuria, persistent doubling of the serum creatinine level, renal replacement therapy, 
death due to renal disease. Composite renal outcome showed liraglutide significantly superior to placebo. However, when look at parameters individually, the only significant is seen in the new onset microalbuminuria. The rest of parameters, the rest of parameters insignificant include persistent doubling serum creatinine level, renal replacement therapy, and death due to renal disease. According to this study, it showed liraglutide does not show significant benefit in patients with GFR rate less than 30 in terms of composite renal outcome. However, no harmful effects were seen in treated patients less than 30 ml per minute. In contrast, liraglutide has cardiovascular benefit in the long term. So if you have less than 30 ml, GFR less than 30 ml, there is no benefit composite renal outcome, but there is cardiovascular benefit in terms of long term. This I will show you a significant positive primary composite cardiovascular outcome were seen in a patient with GFR less than 60 ml per minute compared with GFR more than 60 per minute. It's very clear here, if you see GFR less than 60 um, ml per minute, it is highly, highly significant, highly positive in terms of <coughs> these uh, three mes. And if you look here, also the presence of micro and macroalbuminuria, also the same. And if you look here, cardiovascular death in the presence of low GFR, uh, in the presence of low GFR, it is more beneficial than, than high GFR. So even though the GFR is low, but there is a cardio, cardiovascular outcome benefit. Leader renal outcome summary, liraglutide significantly reduce the risk of renal outcome in patients with diabetes type 2 and high risk of cardiovascular disease, largely driven by lower incidence of microalbuminuria. 22% relative risk reduction for the composite renal outcome, p-value very significant, 0 0.003. 26% relative risk reduction for new onset of persistent microalbuminuria, also the p-value very significant, very significant. The effect of liraglutide on the composite renal outcome appears to be independent of baseline renal risk. Thank you. This is yeah. my uh, last uh, slide. So if you have uh, any, uh, any questions, uh, Dr. Yaz, Dr. Wolfgang, about this case, then we'll discuss no, that. No, I, I agree. Uh, it's um, uh, almost um, because of the small numbers, not everything, as you see with the p-values of interaction are significant. But as you said, I mean, the tendency is clear. And I, I think also from the clinical point of view, these EGFR patients below 60 are the more ill patients. I mean, um, CKD is an indicator also, as you all know, for cardiovascular risk. So these are really the more sick patients, and these more sick patients uh, have a greater benefit with regard to cardiovascular outcome compared to those who are less uh, compromised. Okay, we have a questions here from the audience. This is yeah. uh, written questions for Dr. Yes. Is hyperglycemia causing damage by a direct physical injury, the glucose molecules itself, or due to other cause? This is Dr. Youssef. Uh, excellent question. Ah. Uh, the, the glucose itself um, can induce a, a glycation mechanism that uh, the, you coat the proteins and the lipids with glucose, this is called advanced glycation end products. And these are the toxic material that goes into the endothelium and maybe induce inflammatory cytokines and endothelial dysfunction. So the glucose itself may be not, but it's glycate, meaning coats proteins and lipids and induce a cascade of endothelial dysfunction through that. I'm sure Dr. Wolfgang will add to that. Yeah, no, I am uh, full in agreement with your explanation. That's absolutely true. Okay, if you have a question, please raise your hands because this is the only questions written in chat. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and you can. Okay, we have. Okay. Well, we can discuss the next time in the our conference your 
interventional or revascularization policy for this patient because the cath that you show was uh, very interesting, showing the diffuse disease and the, the non-inviting nature of CAD in diabetics. Okay, anybody? Did you send him the surgery or did you stent his left main? We discussed uh, the case with, the, this is a case for surgery. We discussed with the, with the family, the risk of benefit of cabbage. So they decided not to do surgery, just medical therapy. So okay. we went. But the left main will be left alone? Yeah, once the families refuse to do anything. So anyone, any, uh, any questions? Okay, I have a question for you, Dr. Wolga. So mm -hmm. one of the side effects of the GLP-1 lyrically is increase the heart rate. Yes. So is this variables or it is, uh, you know that patients with heart failure, our patients with heart failure, we, we, uh, the, main, the main aim of management to reduce the heart rate below 70. So, mm -hmm. so what do you think? So what's your- Yeah, opinion? I mean, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it's resting heart rate and it has increased um, depending on the molecule in the range of two to four in some uh, studies uh, up to six, but mainly two to four beats per minute. Uh, it's interesting, you cannot block that by beta blockers, but you can block it by this channel blocker, Evra, Evra, Evra thing. Evabradine. Right. Um, one has to say, okay, this is uh, not uh, nice to have, as a cardiologist would say, because uh, as you said, um, you want to bring it down. But one has to say, um, despite this small increase in resting heart rate, and that was present in the cardiovascular outcome studies, it dot, did not blow away the positive effect on cardiovascular outcome. So, um, and the second interesting finding was, if you do a subgroup analysis, um, saying that um, where was the, um, the um, increase in um, resting heart rate greatest? Was it in the patients with high heart rate already? Let's say in the uh, heart failure patients running around uh, 85 to 90, or was it in the lower group? And the interesting point was, it was at the patient group of 60s to 70s that the increase in resting heart rate was highest. So a cardiology colleagues um, with whom I discussed that said, okay, that's uh, good luck. Those are the patients probably not getting any harm from that increase. It would be much more deleterious if you agree, you are a cardiologist, that if we increase the heart rate from 85 to 90 in a heart failure patient. But that is interestingly not the case. The reason is not known. The mechanism is also a little bit unclear. It's probably a direct effect via GLP-1 receptor, uh, receptors located around the sinoatrial region. And that would explain why this uh, channel blocker, Ivrabinin, uh, blocks it. So I think in general, it's not a contraindication for using it in CD patients. Okay, we have a question from Dr. Muhammad Jabari. Just one second, Muhammad Jabari promote. Dr. Muhammad, are you there? Okay, Dr. Muhammad, he's not there. He went out. Okay. Okay, uh, Dr. Yes, this is questions maybe we will discuss with Dr. Wolfgang about, uh, we ha Dr. Wolfgang, you know that uh, this, this is the month we have fasting. We should fasting from, from morning to evening. Do you recommend, yeah. uh, you know that GLP-1, uh, the side effect is nausea and vomiting. Yeah. Do you, do you think this is uh, appropriate to take this medication in this month or not? You can. Uh, I, I, I mean, initiate, initiate. Yeah, and we start, I mean. I am not going to say... Yeah, ah. yeah. you can even start it. Um, there are some studies of uh, use of GLP-1 receptor agonist uh, in Ramadan, uh, even with liraglutide and also with some others. Um, I think it depends very much on the um, 
interaction with your patient. What I learned from your colleagues uh, in the um, uh, Arabic region is that very many, pay, or let's say uh, that the majority of patients does not really lose weight during Ramadan because mm -hmm. the break of the fast then leads to uh, these very nice social meals and of course a high calorie intake. And so most of the patients uh, will stay at their weight or may even increase their weight. One has to discuss it with the patient because if you, for instance, um, use GLP-1 receptor agonist like liraglutide, uh, and you want to introduce it because of several reasons, uh, acute ACS, and now the patient needs something. Um, if you inst uh, start that during Ramadan, you have to explain to the patient that the result could be that uh, after the break of the fast, he feels uh, or his appetite is reduced. If the patient wants to lose weight, it could be a good strategy. If the patient says, oh no, I don't, I want to really have the social interaction after the break with my family and eat and so on, then it's not such a good idea. Okay. Uh, so it's a very individual indi uh, indication then, but it works. And the good news is it does not create hypoglycemia. That is completely different. For instance, if you put a patient then on new insulin, you have to be very careful and you have to adjust that to this fasting and break of the fast period. So it's a quite a difficult process. Uh, that is not true for GLP-1. So my recommendation is that one should discuss it with a patient. If he says, yes, I want to lose weight even during the break and during the Ramadan, then I would go low dose not uh, immediately going up to 1.8 milligram in liraglutide, but maybe stay a little longer on 0.6 and then go to maybe 0.9 even. That is not recommended by Novo Nordis, but it's still possible. So get the patients uh, acquainted to the substance and then see what happens in his social uh, break of the fast. Um, what can I ask uh, Dr. Wolfgang a question? Yeah. Uh, when you have a patient on kind of low dose insulin and you want to take him off insulin and switch him to GLP-1 agonist because a lot of cardiologists do not feel comfortable dealing with patients on insulin. Mm -hmm. Let's say I see a patient who is on two anti-diabetic medications and maybe 20 units of insulin a day. What is the equivalent dose in general of a GLP-1 that you say, well, I'm going to stop insulin at this <coughs> dose and this GLP-1 uh, are going to still be enough to yeah. keep the blood sh sugar that, controlled? That's an interesting question. Probably my endo colleagues would murder me if I give you the recommendation, but I do it. Well, mm. there is no equivalent dose. What mm. one should do is if a patient, for instance, is on 20 units of probably Lantus, a long acting insulin, one single shot, has no prandial insulin, it depends then very much. What is the glycemic control of that patient? Is mm. he well controlled? Has he an HbA1c, let's say, even below 6.5? Then it indicates that he is really not needing the insulin. What I would do then is not stop insulin. That could really prevail, could cause in some patients, if they really need the insulin, uh, could cause ketoacidosis. Mm. Reduce it. Yeah, you could say, okay, now we are introducing a very potent drug that does not induce hypoglycemia. For instance, liraglutide, we start on that. And then let's reduce the Lantos from 20 to 12 units. And mm. then see what happens. You control the morning fasting plasma glucose level. And if it works and the patient is not hypo, uh, but also not hyper, you can stepwise try to go out but it should be done very carefully. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ghassan, there is, Dr. Ghassan, are you with us? Dr. Ghassan? Yes, please. Yeah, go ahead. I want to... Yeah, hello. Uh, hello. Yeah. Uh, what is the time to take the drug during Ramadan? I did not get the first one. What is the... the best time yeah. to take that in Ramadan? Yeah, good question. I mean, um, if the patient is really interested uh, in principle, let's say in principle for liraglutide, it doesn't matter. 
whether you inject it morning or evening, um, it is more or less the same effect on weight. But in Ramadan, I would say there could be a difference because the drug is, uh, has a half-life of, right, of approximately 14 hours. So the inhibition of appetite would be more potent if uh, he or she injects in the evening, so before sunset. So then you have the maximum concentrations, uh, even with low dose, let's say 0.6 or so, and you have to discuss that with the patient uh, and have to uh, give him the uh, forecast, it will reduce your appetite. So you will eat after the break less than you would have done without Liraglutide. And, but be relaxed, you can eat what you want and try uh, to have everything, but at a small, more, smaller amount. If the, if the person feels happy with that strategy, that's fine. But definitely I was called by some of your Arabic or by my Arabic endo colleagues that some patients don't like that. They say, okay, I want to really have this social meal and I want to eat with appetite and I don't want to have that drug then. Um, it depends. I mean, what is the motivation of the patient? In general, I would say no difference of time point of injection. We only modify that to counteract side effects. If a patient, for instance, has his main meal every day because business in the evening and um, he, you inject, he injects two hours before and then can reduce the size of the meal, then it's fine if he is happy with that. If a patient injects in the morning and says, okay, I have that nausea all the day and can't work very well, then we switch from morning to evening or vice versa. But that is the general recommendation. Depending on the motivation of the patient, if he really wants to lose weight during Ramadan, then inject two hours before sunset. But uh, can I ask you, if, would you get more nausea if you injected it in an empty stomach or after some food? <laughs> A very good question. Has not been studied. My impression is that, um, that the fullness, at least, is higher in a filled stomach. Uh, mm. But also in an empty stomach, you have central effects that could contribute also to some nausea. So in general, I would say fullness directly related to filled stomach um, dizziness, uh, crumpling, and so on could be also true in empty stomach. But one can try. It's not predictable. Dr. Mohammed Jabari, talk. Uh, I allow. I, I am with you. Yeah. Okay. Sami. What's what's okay. the question? Yeah. Hello, hello, everybody. Ramadan Kareem for all. Hello, Mohammed. Uh, regarding, uh, firstly, and very nice lectures. Thank you so much. Uh, firstly, uh, regarding to your case, Mahmoud. Yes. If, if your patient, you, you, you put it in maximized medical treatment and good controlling of diabetes is يعني, very good for her. If you, your patient cannot tolerate or refuse to take G, G, GLP-1, what you will do? I will convince him to take insulin. No choice. We don't have choice. The other choice is neglectin. And we have three choices. Number one is uh, insulin and neglectin. This is two options. Dr. Wingaf, what do you think? Do you agree with me or you have any yes. other? Yes, you are right. Mm. I mean, uh, there's no other option. What one could do is, of course, um, reduce the, uh, the re what is the reason why he cannot take GLP-1? Uh, one has to discuss it with him. And if it's really severe nausea and or vomiting even, what you should do is reduce the dose. Go back to 0.6 and then climb up very slowly. So the recommendation by Novo Nordis saying you do 0.6 at the beginning and then switch after two weeks to 1.2 and then very quickly to 1.8, that's too fast for many patients. So you can use the intercase and say 0 0.6, 0 0.9. Then if nausea comes up, go back to the old uh, dosage before and try to convince the person to stay on some amount of GLP-1. That normally works in, I say, 70% of those who feel nausea. 
some 20 or 30 percent say no i can't stay it it's uh, not fun uh, so there you have to put them on insulin or lena so absolutely right uh, dr mahmoud there's no alternative okay mahmoud i just realized that you just got a free trans mediterranean endocrine consultation on your patient yeah <laughs> <laughs> That's true, yeah. but that's uh, fun. That's I the beauty of uh, online meetings. We have the questions from uh, Dr. Youssef, or just one question for Dr. Youssef, yeah. Can I Dr. start? Dr. Youssef, yeah, uh, go ahead. Thank you. thank you very much for these beautiful lectures. Uh, my question is, is it safe, maybe Dr. Wolfgang will answer me, is it safe to use or to start SGL2 inhibitors in Ramadan, putting in mind the probability of dehydration and probably euglycemic ketoacidosis? Thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, absolutely, great. Um, yes, one has to really consider this uh, main side effect that could happen um, with SGLT2 inhibitors. It, it happens more often in patients that um, who um, really need insulin. So to say, if patients uh, are long-running diabetes, had already a lot of drugs, are um, no more longer effective on SUs, that is an indicator because SU are very potent um, releases of insulin and if they do not work that means that patient should get insulin and if you don't put that person on insulin and then combine fasting with SGLT2 inhibitor in a person who is insulin lacking that would increase definitely the uh, danger and risk for diabetes ketoacidosis so one has to be aware of that and uh, watch these patients closely and see what, how they behave during this fasting period and uh, perhaps do a little bit more repetitive measurements of uh, ketone bodies. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Wolfgang. Thank you, Dr. Ias. Maybe we, You're welcome. we finish everything and see you soon in ICC meeting. Thank you again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for thank inviting Thank you, me. everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah, hi, Dua. So much. Very nice uh, interaction. All the best for you all in Jordan. Thank you, thank Dr. you. Dr. Stay Schmidt. safe. Thank you so much for a wonderful and soon. Thank you, Mahmoud Zre. Okay, thank you. It was a, a wonderful discussion. Thank you, Duha. So, thank you, Duha. Duha, I'm Duha. We lost, we lost her audio. Okay, okay. See you, see you soon. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.